Welcome to Grounded Theory Unbound, a podcast about all things Grounded Theory. This podcast is hosted by the Veterans and Families Institute for Military Social Research at Anglia Ruskin University. I am your host, Dr. Niki van Vechel, and in today's episode, I'm talking to two of the leading lights of contemporary Grounded Theory, Professor Melanie Burks and Professor Jane Mills. Melanie is Professor of Nursing and Midwifery at James Cook University in Australia. Jane is Pro Vice Chancellor Health Innovation and Dean of La Trobe Rural Health School at La Trobe University, also in Australia. Together, Melanie and Jane are the most famous of their, for their excellent book, Grounded Theory, A Practical Guide. Their book has recently been released in its third edition, and Melanie and Jane have now also launched an online training course in Grounded Theory. Because of these developments, I invited them to the podcast to discuss aspects of developing as a grounded theorist. Without further ado, I present Melanie Burks and Jane Mills. Welcome, uh, Melanie. Welcome, Jane, to um, this podcast episode. And thank you very much for making time. That is appreciate it. I appreciate you've got very busy days and you're doing this at the end of your day. For me, it's an early start, but for you, it's the end of what has been a long working day. As we're briefly talking before we started recording this, um, the main reason that I've asked you to come and talk to me is because you've got some very exciting new things happening. One of those being a grounded theory online self-paced training course, according to the marketing blurb. I'm very interested in the self-paced aspect because that makes it very exciting. But um, can you perhaps start a little bit with why did you decide to run an online training course in grounded theory because you've been doing some training courses face to face following you on various social media platforms I'm aware that there are things happening um, all the way over in Australia um, for which I'm very jealous but why online and why in this format that's a great question Nikki and I think um one of the things that Jane and I found with those events that we have been running that you referred to, uh, some workshops, and we've been doing workshops on and off over the years in various formats, and we've started to do some uh, workshops for beginners because for all the reasons that we've been discussing, students can often be overwhelmed when they first embark on a grounded theory study. The terminology is unfamiliar. It looks overwhelming all the books that that you, that are laid out and all of the different opinions and positions that people have and so Jane and I have really made it our mission in the 20 years or so that we've known each other to demystify ground theory because we know from experience that it can be a difficult track to start walking on and I think once you get to the end of it you're a convert but at the beginning it can be difficult especially if as often happens, you have supervisors who are substantive experts, but they're not methodological experts in the area of grounded theory. And so us producing resources that makes it easier is a a real important part of the work, a very important part of the work that we do. What we found over recent years, and we can blame the pandemic, I expect, is that the um, interest in attending on-site workshops has diminished. And when we ran our last one at the end of last year, we got a lot of feedback saying, is it online? I wish we could do it online. And so following that, we did our webinar series and our webinar series was vastly more successful in terms of attendance. And I think we had over 100 in the um, in the workshop, the webinar series that we ran with so much interaction, lots of questions. And so for us, it was a natural next step. The uh, the course is designed for people, as you've indicated, to be able to do it at their own pace. So they can enrol whenever they like. They can um, com- complete it any time. It, there's about 10 hours of content, but they can take up to six months to complete it. And uh, if they come at the end with CPD points, with a digital credential, but also the opportunity along the way to challenge themselves with different activities. And there's a final assessment that gives them some confidence in their ability to use grounded theory methods. So I'm not sure if that's fully answered your question, but I'm sure that we'll get to other aspects of it as we go along. Um, I, yeah, I think it does. I mean, what What is it um, from your side, Jane? Because, I mean, it's a collaborative project. Have you got anything else where you go, do you know what, that was really something that, that reason why I wanted to do it? I think what's become really apparent over the many years that Mel and I have been collaborating together. So, as you said, uh, Nikki and I have just published the third edition of our Grounded Theory book. 
Um, and that's a very traditional format. So it's a, it's a, you know, hard copy. I mean, more, in more recent times, a lot more digital versions of it have been sold. So uh, it does quite well um, in the electronic format. But it's only one way of, of trying to deliver that information. And so we've really, I mean, o over the years, we've done numerous workshops and webinars. And, and usually it's a sort of a pro bono type of exercise where we have an opportunity to sit with students because they are largely um, graduate research students that want to engage with us in these sorts of ways and just um, try and explain the material in a different way. And then this course really adds another layer to that because it's, again, just a different way of engaging with people. And, and I can't take any credit for the wonderful educational design, instructional design, <laughs> that's not my bag. Melanie and, and Ben have done a really terrific job um, leading that part of um, pulling this course together. But it is really engaging. It's fun. You know, it's got lots of sort of action-based activities in there. And I think it just delivers the information again using a different format and a way that allows um, the participant to sort of go, oh, yeah, I read about that in the book or I can remember hearing about that when I listened to a recording of the webinar, but actually now I can sit with this and I can engage with that same material again um, in a different way. And so for us, it's just about trying to reinforce those messages. I really like the idea of, of having it as a as a, an on demand type thing, I guess, um, because one of the things I, I find so often with uh, with like the face to face of the live courses, because I mean they're, they're run all over the world by various people who are very esteemed grounded theorists in most cases, but as you say, it's they're not always easy to attend. The pandemic has shifted people's expectations of what what CPD is, so I think having an on demand training course is is a good thing um and it's a way of managing demand i guess um but i'm the the thing that i would the only thing i would go okay but how would people experience this and you you probably have a, a sensible opinion about this the the thing that i always find difficult with self-paced courses is the interaction element so if i have a question then what do i do and particularly from a grounded theory perspective everything and every bit that you find and read it gives you more questions than answers and i think that's the, the thing that probably and we find is when when we run our um we're in our seminars as well they usually end up with more questions than answers in the end which is good for us because it gives us plenty more topics to run seminars on but how have you managed that element of grounded theory training. I'm not going to call it training because I don't know what else to call it, but how would you manage that? Well, I, I don't think it's a bad thing because when you're a graduate student, for example, what we want from our graduate students is for them to continue to develop the way that they think. And so if it's sparking different thoughts and ideas and challenging ways of thinking, then that's a great thing. But to take your point that we don't want to leave people feeling like they're left in the lurch, the there is it's a very interactive course as Jane has indicated so every slide or page that you're faced with has something you have to do on that page you can't just um just uh, it's not a content that's delivered didactically and you just read it there's there's things you have to sit and spin or or a drag and drop or whatever or watch um and so there's there is that level of interaction and we we did think about this quite a bit because we you know, we didn't want to be inundated with people asking us lots and lots of little questions which can be answered in the book or are answered in the course. Mm. But we do provide students with an email address where they can contact us and it will be Jane and myself generally who will answer mm. the questions if it's uh, a substantive question regarding grounded theory um, because we don't want to leave people hanging. We are, Jane and I are often contacted randomly by people just saying, you know, I read your book and I'm, you know, I just don't do, I don't understand this thing that you've said, or my supervisors have said I have to do this or whatever. And they almost die of shock, don't they, Jane, when we respond? And we, Jane and I are very similar in that we respond to emails very quickly. Um, so mm. they'll get a response, especially to other parts of the world. They go to bed that night and they can't sleep because they're worried <laughs> about something. And they get up the next morning and we say, listen, don't, don't overthink this. You know, actually, this is another way to look at it. And that's, um, and so we, we, 
we want to give back. For us, it's about, um, you know, we had great supervisors, we had great mentors, and we want to be that for other students. It's there's Jane and I are really passionate about our students. We don't like to see people struggle unnecessarily. A PhD should it's not easy, as we tell our students, or that everyone would have one, but it's uh, it's about that. And I hate the word journey, but it's about that journey through yeah. um, developing the way that you think and becoming a, a different person or scholar or um, thinker at the end of it. So um, for us, we don't have a problem with people contacting us with questions. We might get bombarded now, but that's okay <laughs> because we, we'd, we'd rather provide an answer that we can we can provide off the top of our head based on the experience that we've had um, rather than have a student agonise over something that, because we know that it can be difficult and, and you don't want to get a roadblock in your research because that can derail you for a while. Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing also is to sort of understand that the online course is um, it works in concert with the book and with the other resources that we've got. So it's not the same as the book. It's different, right? It's completely different uh, in many ways in terms of, um, you know, the way that the course allows students to interact with material and the examples and the type of material, all that stuff is different. But the concepts are reinforced. And so the student can actually go back to the book and I think probably I mean it's a bit tricky it's only early days so far um, most of the people that have completed the course um, tend to be um, our actual PhD students but that's been good and um, and we've been getting lots of really positive feedback but uh, uh, that's the feedback that I've also had is that um, it just gave those students another way in to try and understand particular elements, particularly things like coding, for instance, um, you know, and then going back again to the book chapter and sort of reflecting on how it all works in together. Yeah, we've got students uh, who did the webinar with us who are enrolling in the course, and that's one question that somebody wrote last week and asked, how is it different than the webinar series? It is, as Jane said, it's very different. For us, it was important to provide another angle of looking at concepts. So we don't restate concepts. We talk about, you know, well, now you understand what theoretical coding is. We hope you understand what theoretical coding is if you've read the book, but and you don't have to buy our book. I should stress that but we do have a discount code if you'd like to. Um, but if you um, uh, if you haven't read the book or, or, or even if you have, it's about looking at concepts like theoretical coding, which is something that's often one of the most complex parts of grounded theory, from a, such a different perspective and providing examples of other people's research so they can go, oh, I get it now, I understand it now. So it's, it's revision but from a different perspective to try and adapt to people's different ways of learning. You've alluded to the book a few times now, so now I'm I'm intrigued on your thoughts for the next one because I've been thinking about it. Would you advise people to read the book first or do the course first? Because you can't do both. Well, I guess you can do both at the same time. But if you were to give people advice, would it be book first or course first? Well. Because they're quite different, you know. Jane's Jane's done a shrug as if to say, you know, either either we can. It could do could go either way. I think it. I think the best because reading the book in itself can be overwhelming, especially we haven't got context. But having I, I picture a student having the book there while working through the course and saying, "Oh, let me see if I can see a different perspective." But I think if you anyone who's read our book who then does the course will have an awful lot of aha moments. God, because even I had, and I'm sure Jane did too, as we were as we were producing content for the course, going, oh, you know what? You know what's a better way of explaining this? is actually to do, because we're limited in what we can do in a static textbook. But with an online course, we've got, you know, we've got um, animated videos which explain things like the difference between data generation and data collection. We've got um, other videos about constant comparison. So it's about providing different media to help people understand what would otherwise be fairly complex concepts. I, I like that as an explanation. And I, I was hoping you'd say that you'd have them both at the same time, because that the, for me, the book came at a really sensible time. And it's for me, it was a combination of the book and the uh, podcast episode you did with um, Dr. Oliver Thompson that quite frankly got me through my viva. Because um, you, you, may, you may or may not be aware, but Oliver was my external examiner. 
Um, no, so, didn't know that. Um, so I picked up on a few um, a few things in the podcast episode. I said, you know what, I'm going to have that ready because that will shut down any discussion on methodology full stop because he said it himself together with you two. Um, I didn't need them in the end, but I had them ready. But it also, A, it was a different medium of thinking about stuff because I mean, I could listen to it when I was walking a dog. So that in itself was really handy. But it also, the, the, the ongoing discussions made me think about things in a different way. And I think that's the, the key message, I guess, here that I'm picking up from you both is because it's being delivered in a different way and we've had to think about what we wrote in the book when we made the course, um, it's different, but the same, but different. It's consistent, yes. but it's different. Yeah. It's cons- the, the message is consistent, but, you know, we, we talk about the different the different approaches to data collection, for example, and we can give uh, a broader range of examples. It's just easier for us to present coloured illustrations of other people's work that suddenly make sense, uh, the things that we can't otherwise do, as I say, in a static text. But I also think um, the information has been organised slightly differently. So Melanie put a lot of effort into that um, one of the modules on thinking theoretically and actually regrouped some of those uh, grounded theory methods that in the book or in other, you know, any number of the things that we've sort of written in the past, journal articles, et cetera, we, we've sort of followed a fairly traditional sequential format in terms of explaining grounded theory methods, whereas Mel sort of turned that on its head in that section, which I think is really probably, for me, the most interesting part of the course is that part on thinking theoretically. I don't know if you want to expand on that a bit, Melanie, but you put a lot of, um, yeah. you know, brain power into that at the time, and mm. I, I think it really works well, Yeah. We were asked, Jane and I, uh, last year was the year before, time flies when you get old, um, but quite a few. We did a few different presentations on a, a series uh, on Jane, did, Jane and I did one together and I did a, a couple, uh, one with a group of graduate researchers and another with a special interest group on grounded theory about how to think like a grounded theorist. Because I, I thought about, we were, you know, we're often asked to do presentations, come and do a one, one or two hour presentation and, um, you, you know, <laughs> We don't want to do the same thing over and over again. You know, this is how you collect data and this is how you code data. So it was an opportunity. This particular group Jane had spoken to the year before, and I thought, well, I've got to come in with something different, you know, because Jane had given a really good overview of grounded theory. So I said, how about something about how to think like a grounded theorist? Because grounded theory does require you to think differently. And it's that theoretical um, sensitivity, for example, um, the ability to theoretically sample, the ability to be reflexive, uh, to uh, to identify your assumptions and uh, suspend any preconceptions that you might have. So, so there's so many things that influence the way you think as a grounded theorist that I think are different than in other forms of research. Mm. And so that presentation, because it was so successful and then Jane and I went on to do others, it to me, it was something that we had to include in the textbook rather than having those elements that make you think like a grounded theorist embedded in different parts of the text to actually pull them together and say, you know what, this is this is why you're going. When you finish doing your research, this is how your brain's going to be working and, and it's a good thing. Mm. And don't fear these things because they're generally the things that people worry about the most. You know, I think imposter syndrome is alive and well in PhD students and um, it, especially because there is so much inconsistency in respect of the way that people write about grounded theory, um, the, you know, the, the generations of grounded theorists that have preceded Jane and I. Uh, Jane and I just wanted to provide some level of comfort and reassurance that it's okay. You know, you can do this. You can. You will get your research. You will get through this. This time. I think, um, <clears throat> and that's one of the main aims of the course is really to build participants' level of confidence, Nikki. You know, like I think if, if people can start to feel more confident in their own ability as a grounded theorist, then they're able to really engage with some of those more advanced methods, you know, and just feel a bit more sure about it. Um, you know, as Mel said, you know, provide some comfort, but but it's really really important that people feel um, confident and able. And quite often people won't have a grounded theorist as a supervisor. Uh, Quite often 
grand, you know, graduate research students feel as though they're having to teach themselves about how mm-hmm. to be a grounded theorist. And I don't know, we, I don't know, you and I have stepped in so many times, haven't we, Mel? <laughs> 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 yeah, and, and often uh, supervisors been, will be rescuing or we or we come and advise yeah. i mean you know, well, there's yeah, a few will ask us to provide yeah. advice and that we're yeah. always happy to do that mm-hmm. that's right mm-hmm. it's all about paying it forward as mel said earlier we were lucky and um it's good if we can help somebody else mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones in that i had a really good ground of theory supervisor so it made life so much easier um, but it's a big thing, isn't it? Because um, even Barney, I think he called it, was it a minus mentee? Which is, is standard terminology for someone who's um, who's doing grounded theory without having a grounded theory mentor or supervisor. And I think it's, it's, it's difficult enough without being able to go and turn to someone and go, but what about this? This makes no sense. What, what does this even mean? And... I think this is where these kind of things are really, really strong developments in that, as, as you say, they, they provide comfort and knowing that it's OK to not know, particularly. Yes. And, and I'm really glad that you that you mentioned this, that thinking like a grounded theorist. It, I've, I've made the most extreme jump in my career in the world. I was a bioscientist when I started my doctorate. And now I don't know what I am, but I guess now I've completed one. I can call myself a grand theorist. Um, but you're right. It is a particular way of thinking. And you you learn to question everything, but in a particular way. And everything becomes a process and a set of behaviours and how people <laughs> do those behaviours. And from an animal science perspective i mean we do a lot with animal behavior so to me that kind of made sense so i I could link it a little bit to my background as an animal scientist by a scientist but it is such a strange thing to be a grounded theorist because nobody really understands what that means because a lot of people stay away from grounded theory because it's strange and weird and wonderful but once you get to the journey for me very much it was like do you know what at the end of it when I submitted my thesis, I went, do you know what? That actually made sense. It took six years, but it made sense. But the hardest thing was the learning by doing. And and this is something I've, I've always complained about this. There's, um, I mean, Nike's always said it, but Barney said it too. Just, just get on with it. Just do it. Mm. But that's really hard if you don't know what you're doing. And if you don't have that comfort bit. I think it was Phyllis um, Stern who said the only way you can learn how to do ground theory is to do ground theory. Yeah. So, and but that's like so many things in life. Um, I, I and I asked uh, one of the contributors to the text uh, after she'd submitted her, her vignette to us. I said we're we're going to be developing a, a course, an online course. Uh, what what do you think we should include in it? You know, from a perspective of a, a student. And she said, and other people have said the same thing to us. Um, who do we choose? Tell us who to choose to follow. So which ground of theory should we follow? That's that's what we want you to tell us. And so Jane and I have always been very, very consistent with this. You don't have to choose. You know, you can you can be a Christian, if I can use that example, without having to follow a bit, you know, you don't have to necessarily be Anglican or Catholic. You can you can um, subscribe to the church broad in broad terms without having to pick a team. And so um, that's that's, I think, one of the things that causes students an awful lot of stress because they think they need to follow uh, Glazer or they think they need to follow Strauss and Corbin or Chamez. And I had one student who's completed who uh, really struggled because sometimes following one can create problems because it doesn't necessarily align with your personal philosophical position. And so she really struggled with that. And I said, it's okay. You just have to provide a rationale. You just have to put into your um, your reporting of your research, why it is that that was done by you instead of following what Glazer would normally suggest yeah. that you do. So I think that's that's just one of the myths. And I just thought, Jane, our next paper has to be myths of grounded theory because there, <laughs> yes. there, there's, there's so many, you know, there's there's no, it's, it's like people think there's one right way to do it and there's not one right way to do it. There are things that 
from our perspective mean if you're not doing it, if you're not doing theoretical sampling, you're not doing grounded theory. You know, if you're not demonstrating insight and reflexivity and acknowledging your assumptions and um, you know, if, if you're not uh, thinking like a grounded theorist, then you're not doing grounded theory. You know, if you, you can call something a theory, that you can draw a diagram and say this is my grounded theory, but if it's not grounded in the raw data, then it's not grounded theory. So there are things that mean that uh, a project doesn't isn't necessarily grounded theory. You might have used grounded theory methods and that's fine, um, but th that doesn't mean that there's only one way to do it. There's lots of ways to not do it and there's lots of ways to do it. Yes. I think there is a, that's probably one of the great, we will we'll write that paper, Melanie, write a note oh. somewhere on a sticky note, we'll do that. Yeah, but I think, um, I, think, <laughs> I think one of the greatest um, pitfalls that students fall into now, and I examine a lot of PhD theses, I see a lot of them, from all around the world, and, and the ones that I'm most disappointed in are the ones that slavishly adhere to one person, you know, and uh, I don't wish to name any names, but it does, there does to be a, quite a trend, you know, towards one, you know, they only do, you know, and, and that's the only person they cite in there. And that actually is really disappointing because for me, as a, a high degree examiner, I want to see that people have engaged fully with the field of scholarship around grounded mm -hmm. theory, that they understand that there are um, multiple sort of schools of thought, but that there are a core set of principles and as Mel said, you know, methods that need to be used in order to actually generate a theory in itself that's grounded in the data. So, you know, I really hate it when people go, oh, I'm just, all I do is, you know, one type of grounded theory, be that Chimaz or Blaze or whatever it might be. But, you know, that it misses the point that it's actually a really broad um, field and there's been lots of really great contributions over the years. Mm. It's actually much, mm. much more about how people position themselves philosophically as opposed to whether or not they follow one particular type or brand of grounded theory. Well, as we know, they should really just follow Burks and Mills. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, they should. Uh, but, you know, the thing, the thing about our approach yeah. is, you know, we, we have, we think we have contributed in some very specific areas. The, the whole um, point of uh, with Jane's mentioning philosophical positioning, we've, we've really written extensively, and Jane started the trend during her own PhD, about this importance of positioning yourself philosophically. And from there, that then determines who you follow and or, or what parts of different grounded theory approaches that you might use. You can you can adhere to Charmaz or Glazer or, or um, Strauss and Corbin if or Burks and Mills, if that's your preference. But we've always said, you know, use use that as your foundation if you like, but look at the others. And, and at least, and I think if if Jane had examined a thesis that said, that indicated that the person had read widely, it demonstrated a complete understanding of every approach and then decided to stick with one and made an argument for that, it wouldn't be an issue. It's when people refuse to read beyond that. And there's a lot that's been written. And, and I, you know, I think I'll say it, um, I really do believe that the book that we wrote was intended to stop the confusion around all the other books that had been written. You know, I think every all grounded theorists, all the, all the different generations have contributed something. I think Kathy Shamaz, it was a bit of a breakthrough with Kathy because she moved us away from the the arguments that were those scholarly arguments that were happening between um, Glazer and Strauss and, you know, the, the arguments and then the justifications and the rebuttals and everything. And, and Charmaz just wrote so beautifully that it was just a pleasure to all of a sudden get away from all of that hard language or that confusing language. And I'd like to think that we've, you know, we've gone um, another step forward and provided uh, and demystified grounded theory and provide a much more practical approach. And that's certainly the feedback we get from people who read our book. And I think following on from that, Mel, you know, the work we've done around positioning yourself philosophically actually negates the idea that somebody would label themselves as one type of grounded theorist. It's not about whether or not, you know, you're a Glazerian grounded theorist, but if you are somebody that positions yourself in a post-positive paradigm, post-positivist 
paradigm where you believe that there is an objective reality that you you know are trying to discover then that's fine then it makes sense to sort of follow many of the things that that person's written for instance i mean if you position yourself as a constructivist or a constructionist uh grounded theorist then you are likely to draw upon the work of kathy shamaz or you know if you're much more around symbolic interactionism and pragmatism then you probably are going to be citing strauss and corbin more often so i think it's more about where you position yourself and then you use the different um writers and their work to support your argument so you're not just following along like a lemming you're actually saying no i'm positioning myself in this way and now i'm going to draw upon the people that are important to my position to be able to support them and that's something that's a point we make in the book that that's something that in this new edition we've really driven home because the kinds of questions that we get asked, I, I don't know how many emails you get, Jane, people saying, hi, I'm a, my name's Baba, I'm a constructivist grounded theorist. I'm using constructivist. And I don't think they really under, fully understand what it means. I think they just think that it's not the old stuff. You know, it's not discovery. I, anything that's anything that's post-discovery is I'm a constructivist grounded theorist. Whereas, in yeah. fact, there is, a, there is, as you say, if you're post-positivist, then own it. And then look at the writings and look at the previous work and just when you employ the methods, apply that lens. That's it. Well, it's it's really about how you actually use the methods that really brings to life your philosophical position. Instead of just saying, oh, I'm a, you know, I'm a, the worst ones, are, I'm a Shamaz grounded theorist. What's that mean to mean? You know, tell me, you know, what's it actually mean in action in terms of what you're doing in those later chapters? Um, yes, I try and be very gentle. I think I'm I'm quite known to be quite a nice examiner, but I still will, you know, pull them up on that sort of stuff. Because if I can't see it, then it doesn't make much sense because a thesis is a sustained argument from start to finish. That's the definition of the term. And and I think you've both of you are just hitting the nail on the head there with the 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 book in itself and the the reason the book works so well for me and this was even the second edition is that regardless of which philosophical point you come from you get something from it because to me there are two different elements to grounded theory one part is the philosophical underpinnings that have led to grounded theory being a thing the other thing is the doing it in practice and i think where particularly the uh, for me the second edition but now particularly the third edition i'm a bit biased because i'm in there of course but it's given people the freedom to make those decisions and say look i've got someone who says it's okay to make decisions that i need to make for my project rather than i need to worry about oh what, what would such and such think about this or does this fit with this particular flavor of grounded theory i mean in my particular case i have got a whole chapter on a on presuppositional interview as a means of making your reflexive practice very very clear and transparent um i when i was working on that i initially i was very mindful but but how does that fit fit in with grounded theory and then i started thinking but you know what it doesn't really matter how it fits in with grounded theory it fits in with qualitative research and we have to worry about how we are positioned within our research project and it has to fit in with our need i need to make sure that whoever ends up reading my work knows where i come from and how am i going to make that transparent and and how am i going to um, um, demonstrate how I addressed my preconceptions and once I accepted that that was okay it became obvious and, and that's so like foundational yeah, yeah but um, we've done a lot of work haven't we Mel, in the last sort of few iterations of things we've been writing um, around the importance of reflexivity to increasing your levels of theoretical sensitivity so there is an actual factor direct link so I think it's it's all this work that's come now and more thinking has been done by people just like yourself and and others that go, oh, actually, you know, that that actually is what that means and this is why I've done it. So it does fit within a grounded theory yeah. study. I think it's, um, but, you know, theoretical sensitivity was never linked to reflexivity in the original books. I mean, nobody ever talks about it. No. But in actual fact, it's it's um, it's intertwined in our view. Mm-hmm. And and the thing is, it was never made explicit, even back in the day, but even implicitly, isn't that what memoing is all about? 
and and yeah, that's, that's doing these reflexive memos. So in in mm. a way, even f- the way I argue it very often now is like, look, just see a reflexive interview just as a really really long memo, and a really thorough memo. And then do you know what? It even fits with Glazer if you look at it that way. Yeah, so, I mean, who says you can't? Uh, exactly. who, who says that you you can't do that? And that's the other thing, the other myth, n- myth number one, that it's uh, ground theory is purely a qualitative methodology because it's not. And we cite lots of examples in our texts of entirely quantitative or studies that have have the benefit of having used both, you know, using numerical and statistical and and um, textual data from various forms, including interviews. So it's not about it's not about the type of data making it appropriate for grounded theory or how you get the data other than those rules uh, for want of a better word around the fact that it has to be informed by the direction of the theory so that's why you use theoretical sampling you apply you apply theoretical sensitivity if you do it properly at the end of the day it's all self-correcting and we make that point through all of our work that people think i'm really worried i'm not doing this right if you if you're doing if you do something wrong along the way, but you're fundamentally working from a position, you're from your philosophical position and applying the methods as we describe them, then you can't go wrong. And I think a lot of people's worries about not doing it right are because there is so much written about grounded theory that people read that is confusing. And and contradictory. And and exactly, exactly that. And contradictory and just fuzzy and like really thick and dense and yes and and this is where yes at some point particularly as a a, uh, as a pgr researcher as a student at some point you're going to have to read that but don't start with it because it will just turn you off grounded theory i think you know i'd like to think about text as something of a rosetta stone (laughs) you know it, it, it helps you to i think we we advise students start with our book not because we get 10 cents a copy each um, that's sold. But we we really do think that it provides the basics, the foundation, and, and, and do this course because that's the intent of it as well. Uh, but from there, you then can expand your understanding of, of what, you know, you, you might want to know more about or what applies more in your particular case. But you can do it the other way. You can, you know, use ours as a, a manual for trying to decode what, the others are saying because Jane and I, I you won't find many hard and fast rules in our work you know we say you know this is we make recommendations and that we we are strong believers in the use of storyline but you don't have to use storyline in a grounded theory you don't even have to theoretically go even Glazer says that but we are strong believers in the power of a storyline for the many advantages that it will bestow upon a study um, but we don't say you have to use storyline. We don't say you have to do this or it's not a grounded theory. You have to use theoretical codes. It's not a grounded theory. We don't. We, we'll say you have to use theoretical sampling. You have to be theoretically sensitive because they are non-negotiable uh, components. But we don't then lay down the law about what that looks like, particularly in theoretical sampling, which can take many different forms. I think that that's also reflected in the journal articles that both of us have written with different students along the lines, you know, over the last sort of 15 years, really. Um, I was looking at a few the other day. I was having a little look on the Google Scholar for some reason or another, and it was really interesting to see some of the things that people are citing, you know, the things that people are most interested in. And it tends to be the slightly, the the ones, the journal articles where we push the envelope a bit, you know, um, yeah, where... There's one lovely one uh, in Tansari Najana and uh, wrote, who was one of our students. It's now she's a professor in Indonesia, but she wrote a beautiful one about um, English as a second language. And so, how do you actually manage, you know, generating and collecting data in her case in Bahasa, and then working with um, Australian supervisors who don't speak that language, and then trying to work through that process? So, you know, things like that, the translational aspects. I mean, Mel's had some really interesting ones. The use of survey data. In, um, in grounded theory studies has been quite groundbreaking with some of her students as well. So I think the fact that we're very um, open to the idea of being flexible, there are sort of some, you know, ground rules, as Mel's pointed out there, that actually, you know, do enable you to generate a grounded theory. There are some things that you can't get away with not doing. But then there are lots of really, you know, interesting um new ways of thinking about using some of those methods. And I've just uh, got a new student uh, who's 
who's actually um, using longitudinal data generation with students over three years in an undergraduate course, um, which is really interesting. And I've really, I've said to her, I've got to write a paper about this because I don't think anybody else has ever really written much about the use of longitudinal um, data collection and interviewing in a grounded theory study, and then theoretically sampling to, you know, develop the categories and and and, um, and that's working through, you know, all sorts of interesting other avenues that, um, that she's, you know, decided upon based on that initial coding. So, yeah, there's some, I think being open to the idea of actually being creative with grounded theory methods is really important to breaking new ground. And I'm really proud of the fact that I think Mel and I have probably done more than anybody else, quite frankly, working with our students in terms of breaking new ground and not being locked into one paradigm of thought. And even other people, students, <laughs> we mentioned before people contact us, and I was just thinking as you were talking, Jane, the number of times that people have said to me, oh, I'm doing this, or I'm going to do that, and I'll say, well, that's not how I do it. But the way that you've explained it and the rationale you provided, it's not wrong. So, and, and this is why I said earlier that you've given people the freedom and a justification for making those decisions. And I think that's a what well, for me is why the book worked really well. And and I'm hoping that um, and, and I'm assuming that the same will go for the for the course. If they go hand in hand, the course will enable people to do that as well. Um, but that leads us really nicely into something I, I was hoping I could have your thoughts on. And that is some of the more recent developments in grounded theory, because we've been talking about these things as we've gone along now when we've mentioned a lot of oh and someone's done this and we we need to read a paper or write a paper on this or just you've now had two pay in the span of 10 minutes it's two papers jane just saying um <laughs> but how does the course if it does how does it address or, or lead on to the the slight the more recent developments because uh, in particularly in the third edition there are quite a few new developments in grounded theory embedded as a vignette in the third edition but grounded theory is ever moving forward which is why um as the the aau grounded theory network were um hosting this um, creative research methods in grounded theory and we've got some really excited stuff coming up for that or by the time that this comes out it will have happened but um so how what what's how are you addressing the the developments in grounded theory well i think you've you hit the nail on the head when you mentioned um, the fact that we uh, we do give students permission to think outside the box, mm -hmm. and we give examples of how that's the case. We provide different examples of um, illustrations of grounded theories that people have produced. We talk about the different approaches to data generation and collection that people can use. Um, we uh, emphasise that whole element of theoretical thinking, thinking like a grounded theorist, and the permission to do that in whatever way is necessary to achieve the outcomes of your study. I'm mindful of the fact that it is a basics course, and we talked quite a bit about where the line was drawn about what we include, and, and we have kind of toyed with the idea of an advanced course. Um, but I, I think we, we've struck the balance of providing the student with an understanding of these fundamental concepts in grounded theory with that confidence that Jane spoke about to maybe step outside of what they're reading in the traditional literature. Yeah. We have the, the last um, module has uh, a section on troubleshooting grounded theory and we actually talk about the kinds of issues that researchers are facing today and uh, provide some solutions to those. So there's a, a, a whole list of different issues that we know students struggle with, and we provide some um, some suggestions as to how they can work through those. I think that that's a very valuable approach. Um, Jane? Oh, I was um, just going to say, I think my dog's little dog's about to bark, so I hope he doesn't disturb <laughs> the world too much. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, does, it doesn't have the same scope for us to sort of waffle on as we do in the book sometimes. You know, the, I always get the last chapter usually in the book and so I'm allowed normally some licence to have a little, <laughs> have a little, have a little uh, you know, 
sort of prophesize about, you know, what's trendy and what's not. And, and I mean, this time I think we wrote a fair amount about research impact, um, you know, in previous, uh, previous editions of the book we've talked about other topics, um, generational change and difference. I mean, there's, you know, so the last chapter of the, our books is always different and that's because that tends to be the space where we're allowed a little bit of um, crystal ball gazing around what we think are going to be the contemporary um, issues that that people are using grounded theory methods are going to face over the next few years. So you, you probably are not going to get that element in the course. But as Mel said, it, the course certainly gives you encouragement and, mm. and hopefully builds confidence so that people are able to go, oh, actually, mm. you know, I, I can sort of live with this idea of having maybe yeah. a higher tolerance for ambiguity and, and maybe doing something a little bit different. And going off and finding some of the recommended readings that we give as well in the course. So there's some mm -hmm. some guidance there about where to go to next and to read um, some of the papers that we think are, are most interesting about what people are doing with grounded theory methods. I used the word comfort before, and I, and I think because that, that's how I want students to feel when they finished it, that all of a sudden you know, it is, and it is confidence, but they can take that next step. And we do talk about in that final, the final module of the course, um, impact. We mm -hmm. talk about it's a, it, that final module is called maintaining momentum, and it actually talks about how you can continue to develop as a researcher when you've finished your PhD. It talks about how to evaluate your own work and the work of others, and what constitutes a, a grounded theory. Um, so yeah, it's um, uh, I think we do touch on it, but we were very mindful that we didn't want to scare people off. <laughs> so uh, yeah. You can only do so much in ten hours. They'll be very, mm -hmm. they'll be busy having fun with all that clicking yeah, I, I, and, yeah. and dropping and everything have, else is going yeah. there. Yeah. I hope so. It's pretty comprehensive given the time that we've, because um, mm -hmm. we we knew that students would uh, not want to commit to something that was going to be, you know, six solid weeks or take them a year to complete. It's about, you know, ju it's just in time education. It's just in time training. So they do it, and people, we know that there's people who. It's not the time for them to do it now, but that's okay. It's a program that we expect will will be available for, for years to come and that we will be updating regularly. And in response to feedback, it's very important for us to gather feedback. But I have to say the feedback from the students who have completed it so far is just five stars all the way and overwhelming. So I'm very, very glad to hear that. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that because it must have been a lot of work to put it all together and, and to make sure it's all coherent. Um, and I guess in response to that, there's only so much you can do in 10 hours. Well, the ultimate message is, OK, well, then read the book, because that's another 10 hours at least, if not <laughs> more, plus everything else. Um, but I think just to, um, my, my final bit for you guys, um, um, I guess for this episode, is um, I'm going to ask the, the ultimate um, examiner's question is, um, is there something you think I should have asked or you would have liked me to ask? Given us a heads up on that one, Nikki, that would have... <laughs> <laughs> no, Come on, Jane, you're good at these. Off the, oh, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, that question about, you know, how does someone move on after the course, um, I think is important. And actually the fact that you've got six months of being able to go back and revisit, it is also, I think, something to just, you know, keep in mind. And this is a bit of, you know, well, it's sort of not really new ground for us. I mean, Mel and I have both been in the business of um, tertiary education for longer than we care to share. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I think it is a way of sort of reinforcing um, knowledge and skills and the fact that you can dip in and out of it and go back and redo bits again if you want to, et cetera, I think is a really big um, plus in terms of students uh, being able to learn. And something Justin. that you did mention at the beginning, Nikki, about, um, you know, why why this course and why we developed it, uh, it's really important to point out that it's not just for uh, graduate research students, it's for their supervisors, it's for um, researchers who are not enrolled in a formal award, it's for other qualitative or researchers generally who uh, we think will benefit from so there's, there's a lot of the discussion is applicable beyond grounded theory. So we talk about philosophical positioning. Um, we talk about different types of data, what is quality data, coding, managing data. Uh, and um, we talk about presenting research and, and having impactful research and how to develop as a researcher 
once you've finished your high degree. So uh, it's for a broad range of people. We believe that there's a lot of people who will benefit. This this course has been two years in development. So um, and a lot of that was trying to get it into uh, a 10 hour yeah. digestible program of study that met the needs of so many different people. So we think we've done that. We hope that people enjoy it. I'm, I'm sure they will. Um, it's going to be a valuable resource, I guess, for, for anyone, well, for anyone, regardless of whether they're a grounded theorist or not yet. Um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, that was incredibly helpful. And I've, it's nice to have these discussions. And it's um, it's interesting to see where your thoughts are going. And it's interesting to see new things come online. And, and become available for people that hopefully will make the steps for grounded theorists in the future a bit easier than they were for grounded theorists in the past. Or easy is maybe not the right word, but you know what I mean. Um, and it's just genuinely nice to have these discussions. It was a pleasure to speak with you, Nikki, and uh, invite us back again sometime and we can wax on lyrical about a topic. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, exactly. well, it's an absolute yeah. pleasure. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Best of luck. This was Grounded Theory Unbound. If you have any feedback or if you would like to feature on the podcast to talk about your way of doing grounded theory, please get in touch with us using the details in the show notes. Tune back next month for our new episode.